Welcome to the Naval War College. I'm Toshi Yoshihara, the John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia Pacific Studies. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Admiral Dennis Blair to speak to us uh, about a whole range of strategic issues confronting Asia and the world. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today, uh, to the here. home of thought uh, at the Naval War College. Um, let me first of all um, ask you a general question uh, related to your experience here. Um, we're always very excited to have someone of your stature uh, to be uh, associated with or to have a connection with the Naval War College. Uh, you served as a fellow of the Strategic Studies Group, uh, which reports directly to the Chief of Naval Operations. I just wanted to ask uh, what you remember about your time here and about your work here as the fellow of the Strategic Studies Group. Well, the Strategic Studies Group was a wonderful opportunity for someone who's had about 20 years of uh, service in the Navy to be able to try to make sense of, of what you've done for the last 20 years and try to think uh, out into the future. I have to admit that uh, we weren't very prescient in our project uh, in my year. This is 1986, 1987, and uh, we were talking about uh, new concepts of operation against the Soviet Union. Well, it turned out while well, we were thinking about that, the Soviet Union was falling <laughs> apart, and a, a few years later, uh, there wasn't much left to talk about on, on that line, but um, the process of trying to think deeply about your profession to work with uh, officers of the same experience but very different backgrounds in the Navy and the Marine Corps was just uh, priceless and something that uh, stood me in very good stead for the rest of my, my time in the, uh, in the Navy. I wanted to ask you about this book that you recently published. It's an edited volume with the Brookings Institution uh, entitled Military Engagement, Influencing Armed Forces Worldwide to Support Democratic Transitions. And it's a book that looks at the role of armed forces in helping the democratic transitions of a variety of nations around the world. You assembled a really impressive lineup, a really a who's who on this topic, uh, to write a variety of case studies for this volume. What I'd like to first of all ask you is, you know, can you tell us a little bit about why this project, why you decided to pursue this topic? It was mostly based on my uh, experience uh, as a, a naval officer and commander, mostly in the Pacific, particularly my last job as the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Command. And I found that we were dealing with many uh, countries uh, that were in, in transition from uh, dictatorial authoritarian governments to uh, a more democratic uh, form, of, form of governments. And the role of the armed forces turned out to be crucial in many of those uh, countries. In Indonesia, uh, for example, where the, uh, the uh, government system and dictatorship had been tightly integrated with the armed forces to uh, support them. In the Philippines, where President Marcos had, uh, had uh, basically declared military law and used the armed forces to support his grip on, grip on p power. There were other experiences in the Pacific in which transitions had been made quite peacefully in, in South Korea, in Taiwan, uh, for example, uh, places in which the armed forces had been very strong supporting a one-party state uh, had made a transition as those countries uh, in, increased. So it was clear that the armed forces uh, in many countries played a big role in their form of, of governments, governance. We were dealing with these countries all the time, yet I found that as a senior uh, military officer and commander, I had I hadn't thought much about these issues of civil military relations. Uh, if you grow up in the armed forces of an established democracy, it's, it's like breathing. You don't think about it. You just do it. You, you understand this, this business of how countries set up systems to control their armed forces to defend them and yet keep those uh, armed forces with their enormous power from being a threat to the citizen, citizenry. So I thought that uh, American and other and the armed forces of other democratic established democratic uh, countries needed to understand more about this process, uh, understand more about what was going on in the countries that they dealt with, and they could then play a positive role in influencing uh, their counterparts to, uh, if not initiate democratic change, at least uh, stay out of the way or or support it once somebody else uh, once somebody else started it. I think you can make a very strong argument that armed forces in democratic countries are far better off than they are in dictatorial countries, which is sort of counterintuitive. We sort of think that, uh, that dictators and 
armies go together like a hand in a hand in, hand in a glove. That turns out not to be the case. There's a lot of internal tension, but more than that, I think you'll find that the military officers and democracies are generally better paid, better respected, uh, have a uh, can concentrate on their their profession as opposed to many of the other unsavory aspects of uh, governing in, in a dictatorship. And most of all, uh, they will never have to turn their weapons against their own people. Whereas the implicit bargain between a dictatorship and, a, and a, an army that supports it is that one day the dictator will say, well, you have to go out and put the people down. And no military officer wants to do that, however corrupt, however, however entrenched in the, in the system. So I thought that the armed forces of democratic countries ought to understand a lot more of that so that they could deal with their counterparts in a much more productive way to help them ease their countries towards a democratic form of government. I see. Um, you have a very interesting section in your first volume that talks about the elevator speech, mm -hmm. which sort of lists a series of things that you can convey to your military counterparts. Can you say a few words about that speech uh, and sort of what's the key message and takeaway that you would like to convey to different militaries around the world? I think the uh, the main part of it is to, uh, number one, uh, in a few sentences, make them realize that their countries, their services, Army, Navy, Air Force, and them, they personally would be better off in a democratic form of govern, governance rather than, in a, rather than in, a, in a dictatorship. And then sort of list the reasons why that's, uh, uh, why that's so, and try to get across the idea that the loyalty of a military officer in any country should be to the nation, not to some particular party, individual, family, who, tribe, whoever happens to have their hands on the reins of power uh, at, at, the, at, at the moment. And so the I idea is that they're in that elevator speech to sort of encapsulate those ideas and, and why that's so in just a few, in just a few words. Now, uh, many times you're knocking on an open door when you talk to a, an officer in that in that uh, uh, situation. But I, you're not trained as somebody who grows up in a in a pretty stable civil military democratic environment to to make that take that initiative, make that effort. You don't realize that those officers probably really want to talk about it. They are thinking about it a lot more than than you are. So the elevator speech was to try to equip. Uh, mid-grade senior military officers and defense officials with the fundamentals uh, for even a chance encounter with a counterpart who appeared to be interested in thinking about these these issues. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned throughout the book you sort of describe the book as a handbook and mm -hmm. so that that seems to suggest that this is really a practical resource for both practitioners and scholars. So how do you envision its practical application? in the hands of practitioners and scholars. Right, I, I, you hit it right. I, very, I call it a handbook, not a book, because I wanted it to be uh, something uh, useful. And I filled it with checklists and boxes and, and uh, things that I, and I, I hope I would find it marked up on people's desks and, mm -hmm. uh, and, think, and, and, and something that is actually in, in use. Because I think it is a very practical sort of a, uh, a business that, that, that we're in. Uh, we're not writing papers to each other. It mm -hmm. has to do with human contact and how you how you operate in, in that sense. Um, bedside manner accounts. Uh, you don't walk into an, another proud officer and say, or shake your finger and say, you know, you need to be like the United States. Uh, there, there are many forms that democracy has taken since, uh, since the United States established its own over 200, 200 years ago. And some of the heroes of democracy in recent years have names that are difficult for us to, <laughs> us to pronounce. They're uh, Havel and Mandela and, and people in different countries who, who express these fundamental ideas that a people ought to control their government rather than the other way, other, other way around. So the, uh, the idea there is to, um, is to get this wider, wider context uh, uh, across. Let me now transition to the topic of the so-called rebalance or pivot to Asia. You served as the combatant commander of Pacific Command, which oversees U.S. forces operating in the Western Pacific. There is little debate today about the strategic importance of this very vibrant region. Indeed, one of the signature foreign policy initiatives of the Obama administration is this so-called rebalanced Asia. Yet, 
over the last year or so, there's been a lot of debate, discussion, and even some level of confusion about the so-called pivot or the rebalance uh, here and abroad. So what does it mean? How would you characterize the rebalance to Asia? It's a, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted about that particular initiative, frankly, uh, because my feeling is uh, we never really left Asia. We never really took our eyes off the ball, at least those of us who were, uh, who were involved in the, in the, uh, in, in the region. The, the uh, fundamental economic and military importance of the region was long recognized by those of us who were working in it. If you look at the strategy documents uh, dating back oh, into the ni 90s at least, the importance of Asia, the growing importance of Asia was clearly recognized. And, and uh, the U.S. Armed Forces in particular were not um, unmindful uh, of that. We were watching the developments in military power in the region, particularly the growth of the, the People's Liberation Army. Uh, we were making adjustments in our own um, military posture. Uh, much of it was qualitative, not quantitative, the, but uh, many of the most advanced, uh, advanced platforms of both the Navy and the Air Force, and it's an air maritime theater uh, primarily, were in the Pacific, not, not elsewhere. Um, so we were watching. In fact, my experience, it was interesting uh, during that time, was that uh, although we, we had many of the uh, preponderance of some of the less, uh, the greatest, uh, most powerful Air Force and Navy uh, platforms in the Pacific, we were sending them through to the uh, Persian Gulf for Operation Northern Watch, Operation Southern Watch. And that pattern s certainly seems to be the case uh, today, doesn't it? Uh, despite the rhetorical emphasis on the uh, Asia Pacific, Pacific region, its events in Syria, the confrontation with Iran, and so on that, uh, that, that take attention and that uh, have military planners uh, having to, to do their part. So uh, this tension between, um, between the economic importance of East Asia and the, and the volatility of the Middle East has been with American policy for quite some, quite some time. And I think it's best to manage that and your explicit policy is we can do both. Uh, the United States is a superpower, can handle both of these. So to say that for, we're pivoting from one to the other, uh, I think sets up a bad story in the one that you have pivoted away from, and it probably causes an overreaction in the one you say you're pivoting to. And in fact, if you look under the hood, there's been quite a bit of consistency in that power. And I would, I would rather have emphasized the consistency I think in these matters it's better, better to do things and not talk about them rather than to talk about them and then be asked, well, what have you done? And so I'm, I'm not sure that it was, a, um, it was done in quite the right, right manner, but I think underlying it, underlying it is a steady strain of American uh, attention to uh, East Asia, which I think is appropriate and I think has been done fairly consistently and fairly well over the years. Related to this, what is your assessment of China's rise in the past two decades? And how do you think uh, should be the United States' role in coping with, managing, or just anticipating China's rise? It's interesting. About five years ago, I did a uh, co-chair at a study on um, what should U.S. policy be towards China for the Council on Foreign Relations. And we had a line at the beginning of that study that said, uh, Anything that you assert about China is true, and you can find plenty of evidence to support it. And as a China scholar, you know that you can find some statistics, some article, some book, uh, which, which supports the most uh, uh, you know, bloody interpretation of China. They're bent on world domination. They, uh, they are, they're growing in order to be the neighbors. On the other hand, you can find evidence that, that says, uh, Oh, China has never uh, employed force outside its borders. Uh, they're simply uh, going for defensive purposes. Uh, they will be a benevolent middle. So you, you can find that there. And I, and I think all of the strains are there within, uh, within China. I, I'm not one who believes that China is carrying out some thousand year plan. I differ strongly from Henry Kissinger on this, this score, for instance, <laughs> when he sort of ascribes this uh, master planning uh, long range view to the China. China. I think. Uh, Chinese leadership has been, this is since Mao, who certainly did have a strong ideological content, but from Deng Xiaoping on, I believe it has a very practical component to what it does. It looks at what it, its requirements are. It tries to figure out a way 
forward within the scope of what it deems possible. It tries it for a while. If it works, it does more of it. If it doesn't, it tries to change it. So uh, I think that uh, what fundamentally will determine the future of China is how well it is able to handle the enormous economic and social adjustment problems which are the preoccupation of its leaders. Uh, good for China for pu pulling 300 million people out of poverty over the last uh, 20 years. It's wonderful, greatest anti-poverty program the world has ever known. But there are more people who are below the officially designated poverty line in China now than there were in 1979 when Deng Xiaoping started his, started his, uh, started his reforms. Uh, and so they have a huge problem still to, still to solve, uh, all of, most of which is centered at, at home. Uh, they want to do that in a way that, that uh, preserves stability and, and that uh, keeps in check the social tensions that always come from, uh, from economic, uh, economic development. So I think that the future of China will be determined by the, these questions. Now, the external component is, uh, is related. Uh, China has made a decision for many years that in order to develop internally with a lot of assistance from the rest of the world, investment, exports and so on. They needed a peaceful international environment, a fundamentally quiet, quiet place. It would, it would not help their development if uh, they were causing conflict or confrontation with, uh, with their neighbors and the rest of the world. So they, uh, despite various, uh, some individual issues, they by and large maintain that, uh, maintain that uh, policy. On the other hand, they've been quite successful in the last 20 years. They've overtaken Japan as the second largest economy in the world. They've developed a, uh, uh, they've been putting money into their armed forces uh, over the last, uh, over the last oh, 15, 20, 20 years or so at a 10% clip uh, from a very low base. So they, they have pretty impressive forces now. And so now they're thinking, now oh, wait a minute, we're pretty powerful. There, there should be a little more deference to China's wishes. Not that we want to start a war, but we want to, uh, we want, we want, our side of these uh, various disputes uh, around the world to be uh, to be uh, taken into more of account by others. We want to uh, have a say in making this uh, system, which has been largely an American-dominated uh, system. So, you know, it's time for us to uh, time for us to get a little uh, a little of the uh, uh, things going going our way here. So that's what I think we're seeing in in this grinding uh, on many uh, different issues in China. There are dis disputes, maritime disputes with neighbors, and in other areas. Now, the, the danger, of course, is that, um, is that uh, there's a thin line between sort of patriotic uh, pride and, and xenophobic nationalism, which then uh, causes, uh, can cause your country to do uh, things that are ultimately uh, against its fundamental interests just because of the, here's the moment. So that's, I think, the, the danger in this, this road that China is, uh, is, is taking. For the United States, uh, I think we simply Number one, we should stay heavily engaged with the Chinese at a broad range of activities from the economic, the official government, military, and, uh, and, and, and cultural. I think we should be patient and persistent in asserting uh, that there are international norms of behavior that countries simply have to uh, follow, whether they're big, powerful countries or whether they are very small um, countries with, uh, with not a, lot of, a whole lot of military or ec economic power those rules can be somewhat adjusted, but I don't think we can simply say that because you're powerful, uh, therefore, uh, you will get territorial concessions, you will get economic concessions, you will get other concessions. And I, and I think that um, China will realize uh, that it is in its, in its interest to follow these international norms, maybe to alter them somewhat. There's no doubt that the United States is, gets a break on some issues because of its power. China will, to, China will too. But it's within the bounds of generally accepted uh, norms of behavior. And so I think the United States should simply uh, pursue a patient um, support of, of world norms. And uh, we have to keep our alliances strong. We have to keep our armed forces strong out in that part of the world so that uh, there's not a temptation to use military force, use power politics to try to, for China to try to uh, assert its, its prerogatives. You mentioned the word allies, and I think that's an important issue here. Uh, many of our friends and allies are, have 
exhibited anxiety about China's rise and right. its recent behavior. Um, what sh what do you think should be our message to our friends and allies in the region, and what should be our working relation? What's the nature of our working relationship with our friends and allies in Asia, in that context? I I think it's um, pretty well established, uh, but we simply have to. It's under more stress than it uh, was before. So the the fundamentals of of uh, agreeing on a lot of the basics of the international trade system, the, the way that disputes are settled in, in uh, peaceful ways, uh, the underlying ability to defend territory and rights by military force if necessary by keeping your, uh, keeping your armed forces uh, uh, strong enough to do that are, are the foundation for that, uh, for that sort of relationship. And then I think that um, we do need to sort of transition the relationship with some of our allies from a big American brother and little Asian ally simply providing base access and following the American lead in policy matters to more of a more of an equal uh, basis in which we actually talk about and share responsibility for some of these common uh, objectives. Uh, uh, through more intense dialogue with them, uh, bring in bring in the uh, Koreas and Japan and Australias into the beginning part of, of discussions of international issues, not simply waiting until a crisis happens and then the United States making an internal decision and then going and selling it to uh, allies and then deciding if they want to go along or not. I, I mean, I, th I think if you, I tell my friends in Japan and Australia and, and other places that um, I, w I would like our, not the fundamental nature of our alliance uh, system, but the day-to-day -day workings of our alliance system to be, to be more like it is in NATO, in which it is more of, a, uh, more of an alliance among equals, uh, even of different size, and less of a US-centered alliance. I think in, in um, Asia, because the, of the bilateral history of it, because of the history of the Japanese alliance in particular, it's more of an unequal alliance. And so I think we need to sort of raise the other, other leg there. And that, of course, uh, having more of a say in it implies also uh, putting more skin in the game in terms of uh, military force, economic support, and so on. So there would be a, a higher price the Allies would have to pay in terms of it, more of the burden of their own defense, but it would be a more equal uh, partnership alliance with the United States, and I think it would be be good for both sides. Let me now transition to the topic of intelligence. You were the director of national intelligence under the Obama mm -hmm. administration, and uh, these days, of course, the issue of intelligence uh, hits the headlines virtually right. every day. Not a, right. not, a, not a day goes by without some sort of a news about either the, the, our intelligence community in general or even some of our intelligence operations. So there's really been a lot of noise out there. Can you help us cut through that noise and get get to sort of the bottom line and some of the key takeaways about wh what are the basic fundamental challenges that the intelligence community faces today? I think the Snowden revelations uh, have really centered on two important uh, topics. One is uh, intelligence agencies collecting intelligence against Americans, and the second one is intelligence agencies uh, collecting information on, on allies, people that we work with. And on the former, uh, I think the facts, I know the facts of the matter are that intelligence agencies simply do not gather intelligence on Americans without the permission of a court. It is, in fact, a secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, a Court, but it is, a, it is a process of the intelligence community having to bring information that they have an articulable suspicion, is, is the term that. Uh, a foreign phone number is calling, making calls to the United States, and the foreign phone number is associated with a uh, ter terrorist group, extre extremist group, and it's the job of the intelligence uh, agencies to find out uh, which Americans are talking to that agency and, and sorting out uh, the ones who are part of a plot from the ones who, who, are, who are not. And I think that's a very legitimate intelligence function that should be done. In fact, I would think most Americans would expect that uh, that being especially against the background of 9/11, where this uh, Al Qaeda group 
uh, organized overseas, came and lived in the United States, called back and forth to overseas, and we, and we sort of learned that we have to be, be more careful. So uh, that process does go on. I think the, um, I think where we fell short in the leadership of the intelligence community was not explaining in general, not specific terms, what was going, going on and making the American people understand what, uh, what was actually being done uh, to protect them and the limits that existed on it and the, uh, and the procedures that were in place in order to make sure that the, the law was being followed. Then I think had there been revelations like there were, they would have been against a background of understanding what the overall system was and there would have been less of this, this uh, surprise and, and shock because it, it was done um, under a law that was passed back in 2007. There were lively debates within the, uh, within the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, within the House Intelligence Committee about just what the, this program should be. Uh, votes were taken, it was, uh, it was passed, and, and that's the, we follow. So I think Americans should be, should be reassured that, uh, that uh, intelligence agencies are not uh, misusing the enormous power that they, uh, that they, that they have to uh, listen to communications, it's in fact done under tight controls and, and, and for, the, for the right purposes. So that's one piece of it. The other piece, uh, uh, spying on allies, I think again, um, now that it is uh, public, we should be more uh, open about it. But the fact is that friends and allies do keep an eye on each other with intelligence means. Why? Uh, because they, even a good ally will often surprise an ally. and. Uh, leaders would like to have a little warning of uh, those surprises uh, so that they can either try to talk the ally out of it or take preliminary measures. And, 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 uh, and that's why leaders look to intelligence agencies to keep an eye on other countries. Uh, I can give you a recent example. The, uh, the P5 uh, organization was negotiating with Iran about uh, nuclear, uh, Iran's nuclear program. Uh, this was the first round of negotiations, and on about two days before the um, agreement was to be, be concluded, the French foreign minister said publicly that he couldn't go along with the uh, go along with the uh, agreement. It was a bad deal, and uh, France was pulling out. Well, um, I think that uh, the leaders of the other countries who were involved would have liked to have had eight hours, twelve hours, twenty-four, forty hours notice of that going on to try to work with the French some more on it to have their own press releases ready uh, and they would naturally have turned to their intelligence services to keep, are the French gonna come up with some surprise? So allies do surprise us. We try to uh, try to find out. So yes, uh, we do keep an eye on, on uh, countries, but two, two points I think ought, ought to be made also. Number one, if you look at countries like France, Germany, Mexico, Brazil, the amount of intelligence work we do with them against common enemies is about 90% of the effort. The amount that we do against them is five or, five or 10 percent. It's a very small, uh, small uh, amount. Number two, I think that relationships should, with allies should be judged by actions, not by whether or not one is collecting intelligence against the other or not. Now the, and the action of U.S. Uh, relationships with Mexico's, with France, with Germany, with Brazil has been very much uh, common uh, interests and doing things uh, together on each other's favor. Whether or not we knew a little bit more, a little bit less based on intelligence, I think is irrelevant to the foundations of the relationship which ought to be based on, uh, based on actions. So I, I would hope that would put this in, in, in perspective. Uh, and this is not one of the things that is or should be talked about publicly when there have been Usually when a, two countries that get along well are, if one of them finds that the other is spying on it, it's taken care of privately so as not affect it, to affect the overall relationship. Sometimes it doesn't, and the big example uh, that, we, that everybody knows about was when Jonathan Pollard, a, uh, an intelligence analyst, oh, was found to be spying for Israel for many years and passing huge amounts of very classified material out, and he was caught uh, by U.S. counterintelligence services, put in jail where he sits to this day. The Israeli government has tried on numerous occasions to have Pollard um, freed from jail and sent back to Israel. The United States has refused, uh, and it's a sore point in the relationship, but the relationship goes on. 
Uh, that's kind of what happens uh, in an extreme case uh, bet between allies. So it's best handled quietly. It shouldn't affect the overall relationship. And I think we'll go back to some sort of sembl semblance of that, perhaps with some, with some uh, rhetorical changes in it uh, in, in future. So I think those were the two big issues that have come out, out of them recently. And, and both of them, uh, I think uh, things will, were done generally right and will be done roughly the same in the future. Now thinking in terms of the role of intelligence in longer term U.S. strategy, do you think that the U.S. intelligence community is up to the task in tackling a whole host of emerging uncertainties or existing uncertainties, including the rise of China, the rise of India, turmoil in the Middle East, uncertainty about Russian intentions in the future? Mm -hmm. To what extent uh, is the intelligence community uh, well equipped to cope with these sort of longer term uh, strategic challenges? The major change that I think need to be made, which I tried to uh, implement as Director of National Intelligence and had some success, was uh, getting away from the industrial model of intelligence to the more modern uh, uh, adaptive level form of intelligence. Uh, the way, w when we faced a single enemy, this, the Soviet Union, we set up a very siloed uh, formal system in which requirements would be sent down to the collection side, the people who go gather, gather, gather intelligence. They would go out, whether it be spying by the CIA or signals intelligence by the NSA or geospatial intelligence from the National Geospatial Agency, collect information, write a report, send it back up. The report would be distributed to analysts. They would get all the reports together, pull it together, write an answer to a question that they were, were given. What is, the, what is the latest Soviet bomber going to do? Uh, what will happen in the 17th Presidium of the, of the party? And it was a very sort of, um, as I said, rigid, rigid model uh, with the complexity and the uh, changing number of, uh, of concerns that we've, we face these days. We, we need a much tighter matrix uh, model in which we put together in teams both the analysts and the collection managers of, of uh, who are interested in a particular or have expertise in a particular issue, and they work together in a tight in a tight group uh, in which the uh, intelligence flows freely among the, among the different analysts, in which uh, collectors are tasked uh, directly, not through some big long uh, system, and in which these task forces are given the very specific questions to answer. And we we do that uh, well in some. Areas, for instance, the uh, legislation that established the uh, Director of National Intelligence, the the IRTPA, as it's called, legislation of 2000, uh, 2005, um, established centers for North Korea and for Iran, two of the adversarial countries that we know we're having to deal with, and they've been very effective in pulling together that that synergistic combination of uh, collectors and analysts and outside outside ex experts. We need to spread that more widely within the, uh, within the system. We're not quite there yet. So I think if we can complete the transition to this matrix uh, mission-based uh, task force type intelligence, we can handle this complexity of, uh, of, uh, of threats that we have. Because we're not going to be able to outguess the future world and say, oh, yes, we need exactly 80 Azerbaijani linguists, and we need, a, we need exactly uh, 40 experts on uh, on the southern provinces of Af Afghanistan. It's going to develop in many ways. We need the flexibility to be able to bring together the right people, including many people from outside uh, the intelligence community who have ex expertise uh, in order to uh, answer the questions. And we're fundamentally an intelligence business. You're in the business of answering questions. And you're, if you're good, you're in the business of an anticipating, providing heads up to policymakers that this is uh, something going, is going to develop here that will affect American interests, and you ought to be paying atten attention to it. Uh, so I, I think that uh, if the uh, processes that were started by this uh, uh, set of reforms after 9/11, the establishment of the DNI, is continued, then I think we will be up to it. I, I've got to tell you that the signs are mixed uh, right now. This is an in, 
sort of an inside game. Not a lot of people understand it. Um, and uh, I, I think we've been treading water here for a while, but we need to get back on track. Let me now transition to the last segment of the interview, uh, which is to talk a little bit about sea power, in particular American sea mm -hmm. power. Um, as you might know, uh, there are a lot of pundits out there these days opining about America's apparent sea blindness, this notion that uh, the United States public, but also the American government, seem to have lost sight of the strategic importance of sea power in, right, in underwriting American strategy and American mm -hmm. grand strategy. Uh, at, at the very least, many of them are concerned about the apparent strategy resource mismatch. In other words, we have a whole host of global commitments, and yet we're faced with these much more constrained resource environment. What is your assessment of, of, of these uh, criticisms about uh, America's sea blindness or the potential for an emerging strategy resource mismatch? I think people are right to be concerned, but uh, I don't think that we're short of capability yet or in the near term or in the near term future. The, um, and I'm not, although there's an element of a sort of pure sea power thinking that, un, that ought to underline our strategic considerations and we're still organized in services with armies, navies and, and air forces uh, and all, um, I, uh, I found that it's more profitable to, to think regionally than it, than it is to think functionally in terms of the power. And I think that the primary standard by which you should judge the adequacy of maritime forces uh, really lies in East Asia, as we, as we, as we discussed. Uh, the, and the standard by which you would judge the US Navy should be that if it came down to a raw test of military power, uh, could the United States keep access to its allies and the and the um, the use of use of the seas uh, uh, against uh, Chinese uh, attempts to uh, inter inter interdict them? And as long as that answer is yes, then then uh, then I think you have enough sea power. I think if you have enough for that contingency, the other trouble spot. The, the Middle East can be covered adequately because although there is a Persian Gulf Strait of Hormuz uh, element in which uh, oil has to move and other products products ha have to move, it's a relatively thin copy of, of a potential uh, PLA and threat in, and well the rest of the PLA threat in Asia. So we can handle one, we can pretty well handle the other. So I would, I would judge the uh, I would judge the Navy's um, adequacy in the East Asian context. Uh, and I would say that that it is somewhat independent of what happens in Taiwan. I would very much hope that Taiwan and China could come to some sort of an agreement that would, uh, that would satisfy the sovereignty issues between them. I don't think that would change the, uh, the chores of the US Navy in that part of the, uh, in that part of the, the world. Uh, so I think that provides it that can provide a pretty good uh, basis for it. And I think most people understand that, as, uh, although as we discussed earlier in, in this interview, uh, chances are, I think, that the United States and China will be able to find the East Asia is big enough for the, for the both of them. Uh, that's only based on uh, China making a decision that military power would not be useful to bring, bring into uh, play, that, it, that they would ultimately come out worse off if they were to either uh, um, you know, threaten uh, use of power, much less actually, actually, actually use it. So I, I think that that's the way I think about uh, sea power. And I, I think that you know, takes you away from platform discussions into system discussions and into, uh, into geographic and alliance discussions, which are pretty important. Mm. Now, I think part of the reason that some of these uh, analysts and strategists worry about the, this apparent sea blindness is mm -hmm. this concern that the role of sea power has sort of slipped out of the American public consciousness mm. or, or that the American Congress seems to have forgotten how important uh, sea power is. What would be sort of your message to the American public in terms of describing and characterizing the importance of sea power for the future of uh, U.S. security and for the future of the U.S. position on the world stage? I, 
think that the um, you don't have to go back to Mahan to <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to try to uh, convince the I mean rest his soul here we are in Newport and all good for him uh, but I I think that um, you can make the fundamental argument that uh, in order to keep Asia a place where the United States and China can compete peacefully and can and can share the use of the maritime and air and space and cyber and cyberspace is the United States simply has to maintain the uh, edge that it has had in the ever since wor World War II uh, to be able to uh, enforce a uh, peaceful region to make the use of military power by other countries unattractive and and have them turn to uh, more peaceful means of competition to express their interests and in a, in a region like that connected by water uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, countries accessible by water with trade routes by water it, the, the navy has, has got to play uh, a foundational role um, I think uh, I very much agree with the general American sentiment that, that I guess Secretary Gates, departing Secretary Gates, expressed most um, eloquently when he said, uh, any uh, Secretary of Defense who recommends to the uh, President that he undertake another land war in Asia ought to have his head examined. But I think any Secretary of Defense who does not recommend to his President that the United States remain strong at sea and in the air in that region of the world also ought to have his head examined. And I. I think, uh, I think uh, most groups that I talk to uh, of informed Americans uh, pretty well understand that. Admiral, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, sit here with us for this interview, and thank you very much for sharing your insights about the future of the United States on the world stage. I enjoyed it. Uh, thank thanks you. very much. Okay.